if I understand you right, let me, let, me see, I, let me see if I understand you correctly. So what you're saying is, <laughs> you have to be very careful that you earn people's trust and that in your communications with them, you, you don't make them mad or defensive. But oftentimes, as communications people, you're the person in the room who has to ask the tough questions. As a communications person, you may listen to them and find out some, you may, you may be listening to them and say, wow, what they just said doesn't make any sense. Or it's completely inconsistent. Or that's not logical. <laughs> or if we said that to the public or to a reporter, man, a reporter would beat them up. <laughs> that's like the wrong thing to say. And so you have to be a diplomat. So you have to be very diplomatic. And so one of the, th one of the little phrases you, you probably um, would be well served to use is, Whenever I'm in a meeting and I have to be the person to be the, the bearer of bad news or to ask a really tough question that I know they're not, they may not be happy with, I will say something like, I'm going to be devil's advocate for a minute or just to be devil's advocate. You know, I wouldn't really do this, <laughs> but, but I'm just going to play this role. I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. How would you explain this, this, and this? <laughs> and you throw out the really hard question. And then they focus on the question because you've, 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 you've taken it, you know, you've, you've, you've tried to depersonalize it and get them to understand that you're not calling them into question, you're not questioning their credibility or their integrity, but you want to make sure that they know how to answer the question. In terms of writing skills, you also be, I guess, being comfortable under, under deadlines and pressure because you're going to be faced with a lot of pressure and a lot of deadlines. And the deadlines are more likely to be minutes and hours versus days and weeks. One of my first jobs at, at the National Immunization Program, uh, I think I'd, I'd been there about three weeks, and I was at the National Immunization Conference, this big conference of about 1,500 people, and it was in Washington. And it was going to be the opening session, and it was about to start in about 10 minutes, and somebody said, did anybody write opening remarks for the CDC director? And it was like, nobody had. And so they said, can you do it? And so I had about eight minutes to write opening remarks with people standing behind me asking, are you done yet? The director wants to see him. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and you have to focus because if you answer their question, you're taking away from your eight minutes of writing time. <laughs> and they get to get them to understand that, look, if you keep asking me that question, I have less time. I already only have eight minutes. You know? And if I have to keep turning around and telling you, not yet. <laughs> Then I have to get, and so, but that's the kind of pressure you can be under. People are saying, you know, the, the, the press is calling, a reporter's on the line, they want a response in 15 minutes, or they're going to run the story anyway, and your perspective isn't going to be in the story. And so you have to quickly write a talking point or a quote, make sure it's cleared by all the right people, and then get it to the people. So a lot of it is writing under pressure, writing quickly, writing for people who are, you know, sixth, seventh grade reading level. If it's television, you have to write for the ear, right? So you, you can't have a lot of clauses and a lot of if, you know, it has to be a really succinct sound bite. And that's part of the communication skill. So, so communication skills would, would obviously be number one. And under that umbrella, there's a lot of different things. Anybody want to ask a question? Yep. Have you ever Never. <laughs> No? No, I mean, it, it, I've come close. But, I, but, but, but you see, part of it's my personality. And, 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 and I respond in the opposite way of the situation. And so if everybody around me is going crazy, I find myself completely calm. And, and, and I have the opposite problem. So if everybody around me is calm, then I, I get worried. And I go the opposite direction. And so... Um, in a lot of the crazy, frenetic situations, I actually find myself being really focused and really serene. And, and what you also find, actually, is that it's not even an option to crack under pressure. Because if you, if you crack, what, what's, you know, a couple things are going to happen. First of all, you're on a, if you're doing media relations, you're in the wrong place to crack because you're going to be on the news. <laughs> you know? And there's no upside to cracking in public <laughs> and being on the news. And so, that's part of your motivation to stay focused. The other thing is, you are, you, you, after you do this a while or a long time, it just, it seems, you know, craziness seems normal. 
You know, and and it, 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 for people who don't do this, I can understand, you know, how they can look at people and say, wow, you can't do that. We have found, and I have found, that not everybody can do this kind of a job. We, we have hired people to be press officers, and it became really apparent real quickly that they did not like short deadlines. They couldn't write under short deadlines. They got really frustrated with the fact that when they came to work, they couldn't predict the issues that were going to come up. And they decided after a very short period of time that, you know, this, is, this doesn't match my personality. It doesn't match my skill set. And I think that's really what happens. And so when you, when you say, you know, most people who would stay in this long term are not likely to crack because if, if, if you couldn't do this, you know, you would have probably discovered early on that this isn't for me. You know, I, I want a more normal life. I want a more predictable life. I can't write under pressure. I can't write with 15 people screaming at me. Um, that just doesn't work for me. I need a quiet place to write. And that's fine. I mean, it, 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 and like I, said, I, I probably couldn't do some of those other things, you know, because that, based on, you know, what I have done. But you also have to maintain focus because, it, it, say you did crack, I mean, who's, who are you going to turn the task over to, right? Because you're the communications person. I mean, um, <laughs> and if you said, you know, I can't do this. But we definitely have seen people at CDC who, who, who have, you know, gotten to the point where they walked away. Um, there were a couple of press officers who walked away during anthrax because the anthrax crisis, it, it kept going and going and going, and, and they were hoping for an end and end, and it didn't end. And they finally said, you know, I can't do this anymore. You know, th this, th th the nature and stress of this is just too much. And I can understand that. I mean, I, and I sort of, I guess, have reached this, the, the, the point where the 24-hour a day, seven day a week being on call was where I got, you know, and I, and I sort of knew at that point that, you know, I need to break from it, you know. So, so, good question. Yeah. Yep. Um, besides the H1N1, what other like diseases have you worked on, like big diseases or diseases I should say? Okay. Sure. Uh, 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 food safety. CDC gets involved when there's a multi-state outbreak of a foodborne illness, like salmonella, E. coli. Now the challenge, there's many challenges with, with, with foodborne outbreaks for CDC to get involved. First of all, they have to be multi-state. So it means that it has to be happening in more than one state. Most foodborne outbreaks are local, and the local health department or the state health department take on the case. Now why is it local? Because it's a restaurant, the lettuce went bad, 20 of you ate there yesterday, you got sick. <laughs> you know, that's the local health department. <laughs> The lettuce went bad because it wasn't chilled. You know, there was something like that. When does CDC get involved? Well, we would get involved if there were reports coming in from, say, Stevens Point, Minneapolis, Chicago, about people getting sick, and then samples were sent to our labs, and we discovered it was the same strain of E. coli. And we would go, whoa, that's kind of unusual to see that fingerprint in Stevens Point, Minnesota, Chicago, Michigan, there must be some bigger thing that's out there. It's not, you know, Bob's restaurant forgot to chill the lettuce overnight. <laughs> and all these people ate at Bob's restaurant last night or the other day. I mean, these people are in Minneapolis and Stevens Point. They're, they're, they're a wide geographic area. So there must be something else going on, such as the lettuce came from a distributor in St. Louis and, and got kicked out to a number of different places. Or the lettuce came from a farm and maybe the, the, the E. coli was, was, got into the lettuce at the farm. And so that's when we get involved, when it's multi-state. Now, we get involved in trying to figure out what the cause is. And that's really tough, because when, we get, when, when, it, when it looks like it's a multi-state um, outbreak, at that point, we're about four or five weeks into people getting sick. Right? Because people have to get sick. Some of them have to get sick enough to go see a doctor. Because if you get sick and you don't see a doctor, how do we know you had food poisoning, right? There's, there's no hotline. You don't call CDC and say, you know, I think I was food poisoned yesterday. <laughs> and so you have to get sick enough to see a doctor. That doctor has to say, I'm going to take some samples, send them to a lab, and then we'll see if it's E. coli or salmonella or whatever. And then we have to have samples from a number of different places, and then we have to find out that, aha, there's a common, this is a common salmonella. This is, this is a fingerprint. And then when that happens, we send out people to go find out what may be the source. And that includes going back to those people who were sick, some of them three, four weeks ago, and saying, what did you have for breakfast on February 2nd? Here's a list. 
check off what you may have had for breakfast on February 2nd. Easy to do? <laughs> no, it's a really tough thing to do. And, but we have, it's, 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 one of, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the few ways that you can try to begin to get information. Is it, a real, is it the best way? Is it a perfect way? No, absolutely not, because people's memories aren't that good. I could ask you what you had for, for breakfast on Sunday, and, you know, with some thought, you know, you may be able to figure out it was cereal or it was milk or it was oatmeal. Um, so that's one challenge. Another challenge with foodborne illnesses is, guess what? Most foods involve more than one food. And so it's not like we call you and say, what did you have for breakfast? And you say an orange um, and a banana and a glass of juice. Yeah. You might say, I had cereal and it had a banana in it and it had milk. <laughs> we might ask you what you had for lunch. You might say, well, I had a taco and it had salsa on it. Well, a taco, think of what a taco is. It's a shell, <laughs> it's beef, it's lettuce, it's tomato. What's in that salsa? Could be five, six ingredients. And so it can be really hard to figure out, you know, what caused a multi-state outbreak. But we work at it and so, does, so do other places. A few years ago, there was a, a big E. coli outbreak, or I think it was E. coli, and people were wanting to know, as more people were reported being ill, what was causing it. We had a hypothesis based on those surveys. 60% of the people in the survey said it was tomatoes. It said they had eaten, eaten tomatoes. So that was, that was the number one answer in those surveys. But that meant that four out of 10 said they hadn't eaten tomatoes. So the media were asking us, what's your hypothesis? So if you're CDC and you get asked that question, any concerns about giving an answer? The press ask you, what are you looking at? What food items are under consideration? What could be the cause of these 1,200 people being sick across the country? You got any ideas, CDC? What are your hypotheses? So do you have any concerns if, if, in terms of answering that question to a reporter? What if you said tomatoes? Yeah, as soon as we tell people what our hypothesis is, guess what happens? A lot of people become less interested in eating those items, <laughs> right? And, and it, the problem there, there's, a many, there's many problems there. First of all, most of those, the vast majority of those tomatoes are safe, you know, because it's only a handful that are causing illness. And so that cause people throughout the country to stop eating tomatoes because we're, we have a hypothesis it's tomatoes isn't terribly helpful. Farmers... The tomato industry, take it on the chin, all of them, because they're all implicated. And so you have to be really careful about what you say in terms of, and when you say it. Because if you don't have enough evidence and you say something prematurely, and when it comes to foodborne disease stuff, as soon as you say things like broccoli, spinach, <laughs> Brussels sprouts, things that people don't tend to eat voluntarily anyway in large volumes, other people go, great, <laughs> you know, one more reason not to eat spinach. <laughs> And, and, and big and industries and farmers and their, their livelihood can be, you know, really impacted. And so you've got to be very careful about when and how you say things. One of our experts, our food experts, said to me, well, we can be more helpful. We can tell them it's the round red tomatoes. <laughs> what do you think of that idea? The round red tomatoes. Is that more helpful than tomatoes? Well, why not? Yeah, I mean, my answer to that question, when, he said, when, when, they, when they said it to me, I said, versus the green square ones, <laughs> you know? And so again, and again, your job as a communication person is to think through and say, okay, if that is what we said as a message, what would be the result? What would be the broader impact? Would that be helpful, not helpful? Would that be good advice? Would people be able to use that advice? And, then we, and that one, as it played out, what also came, came under suspicion was peppers jalapeno peppers. And then when you have tomatoes and peppers, what happens? People start thinking salsa and, 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 and foods that may have peppers and tomatoes. And so, and that sends you down a different path. You know, and, and then when you say salsa, what happens? If, they, if, you, if you were CDC and you said, okay, we think we're, it's salsa. Is that any different than saying tomatoes? No, I mean, it's, it's just as tough because there's a, if you walk through a grocery store, you know, and get down that, that one aisle where all the salsa jars are, there's a gazillion of them. 
And again, most of them had, you know, we didn't have any evidence that any of them were, were, were implicated. And, and then there's restaurant salsa. And some of them buy it from other places, and some of them make their own. And so it gets really complicated from a messaging point of view. But we had to deal with that one for about three or four months. And we started with tomatoes. It added peppers. We went to salsa. And at the end, we never really found a smoking gun. We found some farms in Mexico that had the same fingerprint in terms of the salmonella in tomatoes and peppers. But we could never you know, definitively trace that back through the food chain and say it was that farm. But it was enough suspicion that, that we thought it was that. Peanuts, another one that was in the news, and, and we dealt with peanuts. Vaccine safety issues are very tough. Um, starting last week, we, had, we, got, we got a report on Friday that Japan had suspended the use of two childhood vaccines. One of these vaccines is, is, is licensed, both of them are licensed in the U.S., one of them is actually used in the U.S. And they suspended the use because they had, they had, they had reports of five children who died within three days of getting those two vaccines. Now, a lot of things happen after people get vaccines. <coughs> and a lot of things, most things happen coincidentally. Children, unfortunately, die anyway. I mean, we're, whether or not they get vaccines, there, there are infant deaths everywhere in the world, regardless of what happens. And so it can be really hard to distinguish or trace it to a vaccine. But getting vaccinated is a memorable experience. You know, they did a study, or they did an investigation. They don't think the vaccines had anything to do with those deaths. But they suspended those vaccines on Friday from use in Japan. Well, what happens in the U.S.? Well, shortly after that, CDC and FDA got questions about, are those vaccines used in the U.S.? If similar vaccines are used in the U.S., have we had any reports of children dying within days of receiving those vaccines? And we've got reporting systems that we check safety systems. Are you going to suspend the use of those vaccines until you've done a thorough investigation? <laughs> Now, what if somebody said, let's, let's, let's suspend the use of, of those vaccines while we look in the U.S.? What do you think of that message or that strategy? Somebody said, you know, we don't use those vaccines. We've got somewhat different ones. We've looked in our records. Uh, we don't see any reports of, of children dying within days of receiving those vaccines. But just to be safe, let's, let's suspend the use of those vaccines um, immediately. How's that for a strategy from a communications and policy point of view? Good, bad, smart, not smart? What do you think, if, 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 the, if the news story came across and said U.S. suspends use of these two vaccines as of now, how would you interpret that? Bad? Why? Because it makes it seem like everybody who probably has got one or has got one in the past has a chance of something happening. It just makes it seem like uh, vaccines in general are bad or that we haven't put enough information into, or research into figuring out if it's okay. better. They work. Well, how well do you think the action matches the words? In terms Powerful. of. Yeah, I mean, it, one of the things you have to be careful of in a lot of things is, 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 is your action, does it match your words? And so if you say we don't think there's a problem or we think these things are safe, but we're going to stop using them, does that, does, that make, does that resonate really well? No, I mean, people go, what do they pay attention to? The first part where you say it's safe or the second part where you say, but we're going to stop using them? Yeah, so one of the things you have to be as communications people is you have to be really, you have to be really on the alert for what seems like a smart action, and does that action actually match your overall message? And so in vaccine safety issues, or in safety issues involving medicines and other things, one of the things that often happens or can arise is that you tell people it's safe, but then you take an action that indicates you don't necessarily believe what you just said. So you say, this is really safe, we've got no evidence this causes harm, and then you say, however, <laughs> Don't do it, or don't use it. And then most people go, well, wait a minute. They must be telling not the whole truth, because they wouldn't say don't do that if they didn't know that it caused harm. And so vaccine safety can be a really challenging communications area, because you can end up with these kinds of 
messages where your messages may not match your actions. And so you got to be careful that you want to make sure your messages match your actions. And so that's another example of, of another one. Um, in terms of routine communications, a challenge is getting people to do things like eat healthy, exercise more, get a flu shot. And why, why would those be tough communications challenges from a public affairs or public relations point of view? Who would not want to you know, eat healthy, exercise more, get a flu shot? Let me go back to the woman in the purple. Why, what, what do you think? Why would, those, would the, why would those be communications challenges? For a lot of things that we recommend, people have really deep habits, deep ingrained beliefs, right? And if somebody doesn't believe in a flu shot, if somebody's a smoker, and you come up to them and say, hey, guess what? Smoking's bad for you. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to go, wow, I didn't know. No idea. <laughs> I'm going to stop. <laughs> yeah? It's not that simple. I mean, it's really hard to change some of these behaviors. That's one of the biggest challenges is that a lot of those things which, are, which sound like great goals, people have habits and beliefs and those are not easily changed because they've come to develop them over the course of many years or maybe because of you know, how they were raised. And so now you're trying to change things that they're not even consciously aware of and that can be a challenge. How about from uh, the perspective of you know, getting in the news? How hard, what do you think about you know, getting, getting the Stevens Point Journal or the newspaper to cover eat healthy, live longer, or exercise more, get a flu shot. What do you think there? Go to the back again. No, we'll go two down. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, that, I mean, it's not really anything new. We've all heard those things before, so it's trying to convince, let's say, a newspaper to you know, write a story that people aren't really interested in because it's, it's not really news to them. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, so I often hear people say, if we could just get this in the newspaper, eat healthy, get a flu shot, um, that'd be great. But it's not a news story, right? And so if you want things to get into the news, it has to, be, it has to meet the definition of news, right? And it has to meet whose definition of news? It has to meet the news media's definition of news. And oftentimes people who are on the client side think that because it's important to them, it's important to me because I'm in charge of the flu vaccine program. Therefore, it must be news. Well, unfortunately, that's not how the world works. It's up to the news media. And what are, they, what are some of their criteria? You know, how do the news media decide what's news? What, what, what makes the news? A thought? Well, what makes the news? If you're, what are some of the things that you've seen in the news? A lot of what I've seen that makes the news is usually like negative aspects of something that happens. Um, like with the um, H1N1, um, I remember there was a lot of focus on like elementary schools, especially because at the time my sister was about that age. Um, and I remember that. Um, they were just saying a lot of things about what like the teachers were saying, what parents of the t kids were saying that were usually negative. Well, what, what do we do? What are we, what's going to happen? So. Yeah, one of the things that makes the news is, is, is the negative. Many people, at, I often tell these people at CDC, is that you're not going to see story. You know, what's what, what's, what's going to make the news? A story that says government program worked or government program didn't work. Right, didn't work, right? Now, why does that make the news versus the other one, government program worked? Well, what's your expectation as a taxpayer, as a reader, as a reporter? That the government program's gonna work, right? That, 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 that's why we funded it. <laughs> that's why we hired those people. It's supposed to work. <laughs> that's the norm. That's, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. It's news when it doesn't happen, right? And, and if you try to figure out, it, it, so you wouldn't want it to be the other way. <laughs> you know, like, oh my gosh, the government program worked. I mean, how rare is that? <laughs> yeah. A Stevens Point education was effective. Jeez, huh, who would have thought, you know? <laughs> That's not how the world works. I mean, the assumption is it's going to work, you know? And it's news if it doesn't, right? 
And so that's one thing that has to happen. Second thing, it has to be new. And so getting a flu shot is a, is a, is a you know, that's a message you hear repeatedly every single year. We used to tell people at the beginning of a flu season that every year influenza could kill as many, in a typical season, as many as 36,000 people die. Well, that would get some coverage at the first press conference when we kicked off the flu season. But at that point, it was done. You couldn't come back a week later and say, guess what? Typical flu season, 36,000 people die. And then come back a week later and say, hey, guess what? It's still 36,000 people. It doesn't work that way. And so you have to have conflicts, you have to have controversy, you have to have something that's unique, dramatic. It has to be new, unusual. There has to be some <coughs> element there that's going to hold an audience. And then what the media are most interested in is, is you as readers and viewers. And if, if they think it will hold your interest, they'll be interested. If they think you're not interested, it'll never make the news. And so if, if I was going to try to pitch you know, the student newspaper about doing a story about the benefits of flu vaccine for college students, I'd have to convince them that I had something that was you know, a new angle, new information, and that you people would be interested in reading about it. Because if they didn't think you were interested in reading about it, they wouldn't give the time and space. And so those are among the challenges on the other end of the spectrum. Other questions? Anybody else have a question? Go back. Go ahead. Have you had to deal with uh, the assumption that um, immunizations uh, affect autism rates? Mm -hmm. Like, how has your office responded to those claims? Yeah, autism and vaccines. We've had to deal with that for about, I guess, 12 years because that's how long um, the claim has been out there. Somebody made a claim back in 1998, 99 that vaccines that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine could cause autism. Uh, that study has been turned out to be fraudulent. Um, there was a lot of problems. The, the researcher who wrote it was paid by lawyers who were suing the government, <laughs> and so he recruited people. Many of the children had diagnoses of autism that happened before they got the measles shot. Mm -hmm. Kind of a problem if you're arguing the measles shot causes autism that you got the <laughs> You got autism before, not after. There were problems with the laboratories that were involved in terms of how they handled the samples and did the testing. And then what happened was over the span of about six, seven years, a lot of research was done to see if there was validity to that claim. It was laboratory research that looked at the theory, and the laboratory research failed to find what that study reported. There were studies that were done that looked at large numbers of children, hundreds of thousands of children, and compared children in different groups, and none of those found a relationship. So after about 12 years of, of a lot of research, it looks like there, there is no relationship between vaccines and autism, whether you're talking about the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, whether you're talking about a preservative named called thimerosal that used to be in some vaccines, whether you're talking about the number of vaccines that children get, whether you're talking about the age at which you get them, People have looked at all those things, not just CDC, but people all around the world have looked at those things and have not found a relationship. In the last six months or so, we've now seen major autism groups basically saying, stop spending time and money looking at vaccines and autism. Now, why would they say that? Now, the reason they would say that is because there's relatively limited dollars to, to invest in autism, kind of like if you go back to the HIV example. And what they're saying is that you've established, I think, that there is no relationship there. And so spending more limited dollars going down that path is not very helpful. We want to find a cure. We want to find treatments. We want to find other causes. Look at other causes. Spend the money on treatments. Spend the money on other things. Don't spend those dollars chasing down a question that we think has been pretty well answered. Now, it took 12 years to get there, you know, and, and so, there were a lot of content, you know, there were a lot of conflicts in, in, in those 12 years, when, particularly early on, when that data wasn't there, where people disagreed. But I think now, after 12 years of research, people have got to the point where they, they're conv most people are convinced. You got a follow? So, and then, uh, so where, do you, where does your office go with that? Because it's, I, we were talking about it in another class of mine, and it seems to be a very deep-rooted belief, even though it was completely <laughs> a lie. So where does your office's... Where do your offices go with that information to dispel that myth? Good question. A, a couple of ways we've done that. We, one, we, we've, one of the challenges is, is, is people want, there are people who hold on to that belief today. 
and you probably will never be able to persuade them otherwise. There are still people who believe, you know, the Earth is flat, and and, and again, it's 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 